I don't have a positive ID yet, but I think we may be looking at Mr. Floyd Collister, also known as Marcel, the grand dame of the Las Vegas female impersonators. You a fan? Mrs. Doubtfire is more my taste. The smell of booze is pretty strong. Well, I imagine Floyd's probably in his mid to late 70s, so if he tied one on last night, accidents will happen, along with maybe a stroke or a heart attack. Yeah, you're right. I mean, you might really be right about tying one on. See her, his wrists? Looks like ligature marks. Someone wanted to make sure their drinking buddy didn't leave too soon. Didn't leave until he was dead. She, you mean, until she was dead. I'm just saying. Hey, good to see you. I can always depend on the kindness and assistance of my fellow CSIs. I just got started. You're welcome to jump in on the scene with me, or you can talk to our one and only witness over there. You mean how she died? Well, at first blush, it's tough to say. Could be natural causes, but the special cirques are those ligature marks on the wrists and ankles. We'll know more once we get her over to Doc Robbins. Doesn't look like it. There's cash in the register and nothing really stands out as being out of place or missing. It's been around a pretty long time. I remember I almost had my bachelorette party here. Not that my bachelorette party was that long ago, but anyway. After you. No prints there. Someone's gotten into the whiskey. Nice work. Our victim has tentatively been identified as Floyd Collister, but apparently he's better known as Marcel. Brass says he's known to be one of the best female impersonators in Las Vegas. I believe the term he used was Grand Dame. You can smell the alcohol, right? PAC might have contributed to the death. Oh yes, the good stuff. Let's just make sure it gets back to the lab. In the bottle. The mic's off. I'm tempted, but no. Looks like Marcel forgot to take her pills. Looks like this Wallace Beganowski is angling for partial ownership in this club. And judging by this note, the negotiations aren't going well.
Enough booze for any occasion. Hello, sir. We're with the Las Vegas Crime Lab. Can we get your name? Sure. Name's Gary Beaumont. I've been pretty much a regular here for, gosh, 30 years, give or take, right? Everybody knows me. I even have my own chair over there. That's mine. Nobody else gets to sit there but my butt. I found her, yes. I showed up about 9 o'clock for Bloody Mary Sundays. That's what Marcel calls it. And I I'm walking in and passing right by the stage, and, and that's when I saw her. Face down. I got up there, and I tried to wake her up, but she wasn't breathing, and I couldn't save her. I I don't have any kind of training. I, I, I used to know CPR, but, you know, I, I, I just called 911. That's all I thought I could really do. Besides Mr. Collister, that is. Mr. Collister? I'm sorry, don't you mean Marcel? Yes, yeah, sorry. It's a bit confusing. Marcel. I, I didn't mean to jump on you. It's just that Marcel was truly a lady. The most kind, gracious, generous, loving, feminine spirit I've ever known. As for Floyd Collister, that person's dead to me. Well, she did own a bar. I mean, I suppose you don't have to drink to own a bar, but, but Marcel did. Drink and own a bar. Both. She also smoked like a chimney. Well, if a chimney smoked a pack and a half in that Sherman's a day anyway. Miss Apprehension scolded her about it all the time. I'm sorry. I wasn't quite clear whether Marcel was having some misapprehension about her health or there's actually a person named Miss Apprehension. Oh, no. She's not a person. She's a diva. The divine Miss A. She's been performing at the club for, well, for as long as I've been here. But you probably never heard of her, because... Marcel only let one star shine here. Hers. Do you know Miss Apprehension's real name? You probably want me to say her real name is Wallace Biganowski, but she'll always be Miss A to me. Would you say they got along? Oh, no. No, no. Oil and water. Cats and dogs. Betty Davis and Joan Crawford. I mean, those two fought constantly. But they needed each other. Marcel was the star around here, but she was just awful with money. Miss A kept this place in business. Do things ever get violent between the two of them? No, never. They yelled a lot, but I think they really loved each other. Oh, no. Poor Miss A. She'll be devastated when she finds out. I should probably try to find her in case she needs a shoulder to cry on. Let me think. No, that's really all that stands out to me. If I remember something, can I call you? Do you have a card? You don't think they'll close the club down, do you? I'll have Doc Robbins send someone down and pick up the body. Pills were recovered at the scene were prescribed to Floyd Collister. They're hydramazine. It's a heart medication. So, if we run an extended tox panel and find him in Marcel's system, that'd be positive ID. Water, grain alcohol, and traces of wood esters, tannins, and lactones. Whiskey. And not the cheap stuff. The 
The alcohol in the victim matches the alcohol in the bottle, which means it was a classic cork party. So that's what Marcel looks like in the morning before she puts on her face. She's been a fixture in this town for as long as I can remember, but I don't think anyone's seen her like this, at least not in public. We pulled her, well, Floyd Collister's DMV records. He was born in 1938, which means Marcel is 71 years old, but she looks much younger, don't you think? Well, what time taketh away, cosmetic surgery giveth back, to some degree anyway. I'll check her medical records for the precise number of procedures. Okay. You know, I hate to be a stickler for detail about this, but we haven't really positively identified this victim. We didn't recover any form of identification on the body or at the scene. So before we go any further, let's just make sure this is Marcel or Floyd Collister or whoever or whatever, all right? I love the easy ones. Here you go. You know, they say celebrity deaths come in threes. I'm certainly not anxious to see another. Here, I found some skin under the victim's fingernails. I collected a sample for DNA. I guess Marcel may have gotten a piece of her killer. What can you tell us about those contusions around his wrists and ankles? Well, they're definitely consistent with ligature marks. The development of the bruising suggests the victim was restrained anti-mortem. I also noticed a larger contusion on the back of her head, also anti-mortem. She might have been struck from behind. She died of respiratory depression due to alcohol poisoning. It's as though she were tied down and then the alcohol strangled her. Terrible. Hmm. But it's possible that all this could have been just a horrible accident, right? Actually, I don't think it's possible. Respiratory or heart failure usually occurs when one's blood alcohol level is somewhere around 0.4%. Now, most people in relatively good health tend to pass out around 0.3. Marcel's BAC was 0.5.5%. I don't believe there's any way someone at her age, even as healthy as she seemed to be, could have consumed that much alcohol on her own. Force-fed alcohol. It's like some fraternity prank gone bad. Yeah, but it actually reminds me of a serial killer case my boss, when I first started here, used to talk about a lot. What did they call the guy? The Barber Street Boozer. The Barber Street Boozer. Yeah, wasn't that in the mid-70s? I think 1975? I was a little girl, but I kind of remember people talking about him. Well, I'm sure it seemed particularly deviant at the time. What was it? Four Johns trolling for transvestite prostitutes. They wind up dead, all of them force-fed alcohol. You know, if I'm not mistaken, all four of those murders occurred in the same neighborhood as Marcel's cabaret, and the Barber Street boozer... Never got caught. You could have a cold case on your hands. I'll put in the request for the cold case files on the Barber Street boozer. It'll be worth it just to see if there are any other similarities between this case and those unsolved. We're looking for any sign of the drug, hydramazine. Hydramazine? It's a heart medication that works to expand the blood vessels. I don't see any evidence that this victim was using it, though. So that's not Floyd Collister. Just what we need. An impersonator of an impersonator. Oh good, you're still here. 
I just don't feel like being anywhere else right now. This place always felt like home. But now that Marcel's dead, I, I just don't know. We're hoping you can help us with a case of mistaken identity. Oh, what do you mean? Would you mind coming down to the coroner's office with us? Sure, I, I can do that. But you mean it might not be Marcel? I don't understand. But sure, no problem. Whatever you need, I, I, I'll come with you right now. I, I, that's not... Oh, no! That's not Marcel! It's not. Do you know who it is, Mr. Beaumont? But, but I saw her! I saw her with my own eyes, I'm telling you! But this... Oh, dear God, that's Wally! I can't believe it, that's Wally Beganowski! I mean, I mean, misapprehension. What the hell's going on? Mr. Beaumont, we're so very sorry, and we deeply appreciate your help. I can give you the name of someone if you need someone to talk to right now. And I promise we'll be in touch, okay? Thank you. Well, looks as though Marcel just went from being our victim to being our prime suspect. I'll have Brass track down her home address and put a bolo out on her car. Or, rather, his car, since it's still registered under Floyd Callister. While he's covering that, why don't we check out Mr. Viganowski's home? See what we can find there. It's what I live for. what you've done with the place. Well, certainly defies stereotypes. Yeah, I can see why you called me for backup. Tough neighborhood. Las Vegas Crime Lab, freeze! Hands where I can see them, now! <coughs> I'm Floyd Collister. Don't... Don't shoot, please. Mr. Collister, we're here investigating the murder of Wallace Biganowski. Can you tell us where you were last night? <coughs> I can't... I, I can't talk right now. <coughs> I forgot them back there. I'm supposed to take them every day. <coughs> Riley, could you take Mr. Collister to get his medication? We'll stay and process the scene. I'm on it. Riley will call us when she gets back to the station. In the meantime, let's see if Wally or Floyd left behind anything useful. That's the cigarette Collister was smoking. Could come in handy if we need his DNA. That's Floyd Collister's DNA. My grandmother collected these. Quite the homemaker. I wonder if it's homemade. It's password protected. We shouldn't use it without a reason anyway.
Somebody never finish unpacking? Hey, I can't speak for Marcel, but Floyd Collister is going to be all right, and he's ready to talk. Come over to PD when you've wrapped up the scene. Mr. Collister, Wallace Biganowski was murdered in your club. He was found wearing your stage costume. Do you know why he would be dressed as your character, Marcel? It's not a costume, and Marcel is not a character. I am Marcel. I would appreciate it if you would address me properly. I apologize. I meant no disrespect to your authority, but I felt you were demonstrating a disrespect for me, that's all. I, I understand. You have a very difficult job to do. As for Wally... Wally spent nearly a lifetime in my shadow. For a time, we were rivals, but... Eventually, he assumed the role of my understudy in the cabaret He was quite good at becoming me, uh, the voice, the manner. And as you are obviously aware, my health is deteriorating, and I wanted, if something untimely should happen to me, I wanted him to take over, to carry on as Marcel. Is that why Mr. Biganowski had plastic surgery? To look more like you, just in case? That was part of it, of course. I, I suspect it was also a bit of unhealthy idol worship on Wally's part, but I saw no reason to dissuade him from trying to improve himself. This question just sounds weird in my head, but here goes. Marcel, why were you hiding in Mr. Biganowski's closet? I was hiding from the murderer. Now, when you two showed up, I suppose the closet may have been a Freudian slip. Look, I'm not trying to be cute here. I had gone back to the club after we'd closed to get my heart medication, which I'd forgotten. When I walked in, I saw Wally lying there up on the stage. I wasn't sure what was going on, but I, I got scared, really scared. Certainly wasn't my finest hour, I will admit that. <laughs> But if someone was trying to kill Marcel, then I needed to hide somewhere I wouldn't be found. I saw Wally lying there, yes. I saw those dreadful bruises on his wrists and on his ankles. I saw the bottle of booze and I knew... I know Wally doesn't drink. Well, not like that. The very fact of the matter is, over the years, I've received death threats. A considerable number of them, so many that I stopped taking them seriously. I figured I can't stop being who I really am, and better to die in heels anyway. But you know, maybe I should have taken those threats more seriously. I should have at least talked to Wally about them, that's what I should have done. Why didn't you call the police? Oh, honey, who gives a damn about an old f... <laughs> no. I will not use that abominable word. It's not right. Let me just say, ma'am, that my experience with law enforcement over the years has not given me the greatest confidence that justice will be served for either me or my community. I understand, Marcel, but times are changing. Sure they are, but you think about how much they've really changed the next time you're walking down the street just holding hands with your man. Then you try to imagine someone like me doing the same thing. Look, I was wrong, but I did what I did. I panicked and I ran away. I ran away to Wally's apartment and I hid there. I guess I was thinking something like the killer would realize his mistake and keep coming after me. Marcel, for the time being, for your own safety, we're not going to disclose the fact that you're alive. That is, if that's all right with you. No, but it wouldn't have been a bad idea. In fact, I didn't touch a drop of alcohol all night.
Wally and I were very close, always. Seems like there was tension between the two of you after all. Once Wally saw himself becoming me, well, uh, he started to become unreasonable. It was still my club. He was the manager. And he did a superb job in that capacity. But I did not want to share everything with him. Oh, he started threatening to leave. Oh, <laughs> so much drama. But I know he would have straightened things out. We always did. For better or worse, in sickness and in health, until death do us part. For all our ups and downs, Wally and I never stopped being friends. I've been staying at his place for the last couple of months. I was there last night, waiting for him to come home. I don't think so, but no, wait. I was using his computer. I was chatting with a few old friends. Don't they call it I Emming? Anyway, I can give you Wally's password. I'm sure if you take a look at the computer, you will be able to verify what I am saying. All right, Marcel. We'll do that. We'll bring Wally's computer back to the lab, and we should be able to confirm whether Marcel was online or not. Well, if the clock on the wall is right, then Marcel was at Wally's apartment at the time of the murder. We looked at Wally's computer like you suggested, and we saw that you were indeed using it all evening. I always was the innocent one. With this killer on the loose, though, I don't know that I feel safe leaving just yet. I'm happy to help any way I can. Nothing comes to mind. Yeah, I have some good news. We are able to dig up all the old Barber Street Boozer case files for you. They were buried down in Central Property. I had them sent over to the lab. Let me know if you find anything. Yeah? Not gonna be a problem. She seems to be in no hurry to go anywhere. Nothing comes to mind. What's up, Ray? Ray? Oh, sorry. I didn't hear you come in. I understand you may have a serial killer who's come out of retirement. I was curious. I hope you don't mind. Not at all. We could use your expertise, actually. Right now, we're just fishing. There's no evidence linking the previous Barber Street Boozer murders to the murder of Floyd Callister. You mean Wallace Biganowski, don't you? Actually, we're trying to keep that information on a need-to-know, for the time being. Okay, well, in looking through the old case files, we have four male victims, each one from a different race and socioeconomic background. Each was married. Now, the common thread that ties these men together is the desire to explore their homosexual tendencies through the apparent safety of a male presenting himself as a female.
There were several, actually, which was part of the problem back in 1975. But here's something interesting for you. Out of the LVPD's top four suspects, two are now deceased, and the other two are going to be very familiar to you. You're kidding. Floyd Callister and Wallace Biganowski. According to this police report, both of them had been arrested multiple times for solicitation as well as lewd and lascivious behavior in public. Yes, there is. We have 10 cards for both Floyd Collister and Wallace Biganowski, and we have a bottle of unidentified alcohol. If we were able to match brands of alcohol from yesterday and today, it might mean we're dealing with the same serial killer. Or a copycat. I should get back. Riley thinks I'm picking up lunch. Give me a call if you need me. What do you need? Not gonna be a problem. She seems to be in no hurry to go anywhere. Nothing comes to mind. Not at the moment. I'll keep thinking. Serial killers are certainly creatures of habit, as well as ritual. The liquor used to poison the four men in 1975 was classic cork whiskey, which is the same brand that was used to kill Walls Biganowski last night. I'm going to ask Brass to help us get in touch with the detectives who worked the original Barber Street Boozer murders. Maybe they can help us better contextualize some of this evidence. Hey. Do you think there's any way we can talk to the detectives who originally worked the Barber Street murder cases? Detectives Glenn Krautman and Warice Briggs. Glenn died of prostate cancer six years ago, and Warice just retired. I hear you had some input on her final case. She lives out in Boulder City. I'll get her number and have her come down. Hopefully, she might have held on to some of her original case notes. Thank you so much for taking the time to come out here. It's the least I can do. I thought you might try to get in touch with me. I saw the news. Floyd Collister murdered in his own club. The news didn't give me any details, but you think it might be the boozer, don't you? Or a copycat. The M.O. is similar. Male victim forced to ingest a toxic level of distilled alcohol. Murder took place in the same neighborhood as well. The M.O., as I said, is similar, but it's not exactly the same. This victim isn't married, nor was he someone who could be described as a closeted homosexual. The one that got away. The most frustrating case I ever worked, and my biggest regret, for so many reasons. Glenn and I worked as hard as we could to close this case. But I have to tell you the truth. The department, at that time, did not consider the boozer the highest priority. That's right. It's shameful. But there it is. I can only imagine what we might have been able to do if some people's hearts and minds had been different back then. Fortunately, for whatever reason, the boozer decided to stop on his own. Glenn and I both believed the killer was most likely someone merely posing as a transvestite prostitute in order to lure his victims. But witness testimony kept pushing us toward a couple of actual prostitutes, one of whom was Mr. Collister, and the other was a young man named Wally Biganowski. And I believe later on, those two gentlemen opened up a rather popular nightclub together. We've gone over the suspect file, but we're wondering if there's someone else we might be overlooking. 
There was this one guy. I'd have to go through my notes here to recall his name exactly. I thought he was particularly interesting, but I'll admit it might have been feminine intuition or something ridiculous like that, because Glenn didn't agree with me, so I kept it out of our official reports. What was intuition telling you about this guy? As I can recall, and you should definitely go over my notes here, these are the originals. This fella had been charged with assaulting one of the victims maybe four months before the murders began. Let's see if I can remember the scenario for you. So this John comes down to the neighborhood looking for some love for sale. He ends up picking up a prostitute outside a club on Barber Street, and this prostitute is dressed like a lady. But before they could get down to doing their business, my suspect, whom I remember thought of himself as a kind of knight in shining armor, swoops down and beats this John up pretty good, defending the honor of this lady. Suspect Gary Beaumont, arrested October 12, 1975, assault, victim Lon Muskie. Muskie was in the act of soliciting another male for the purpose of prostitution. Muskie released from police custody, not charged. Let me get this straight. Gary attacks this guy Muskie, and a few weeks later, Muskie becomes one of the Barbara Street boozer victims? And then, 35 years later, who should discover our latest victim but Gary Beaumont. Well, Brass ran Gary Beaumont through the system, but he has no known address. Brass put out a bolo, but I'm hoping we can find Gary ourselves. I'm sure it won't hurt to talk to Mr. Beaumont again, but I agree with Waris's partner. He's not your man. What makes you say that? The Barber Street boozer obviously felt homicidal rage towards his victims. Married men who were secretly soliciting sex from male prostitutes dressed as women. Wallace Biganowski was an unmarried, openly gay female impersonator. Based on the circumstances surrounding Mr. Beaumont's assault charge, I'd say he was the kind of man who would have wanted to protect Wally, not hurt him, and certainly not kill him. Well, from what I saw of Mr. Beaumont's behavior at the crime scene and at the morgue, he would have to be a supremely talented actor. He was on an emotional roller coaster. Maybe. For a serial killer, murder is an addiction. Recovery requires a lifelong commitment to some deliberate strategy of behavior modification. And unfortunately, there is no 12-step program for cold-blooded killing. So serial killers usually stop when they're caught or they die. In my professional opinion, if Gary Beaumont is a serial killer, it's difficult to believe that he just decided one day to stop cold turkey. You're probably right, Ray, but I still think we should bring him in just in case cover all the bases. And if Beaumont's been such a loyal customer all these years, maybe Marcel knows where he likes to hang out when he's not at the cabaret. What do you need? Not gonna be a problem. She seems to be in no hurry to go anywhere. Gary? You think Gary had something to do with this? We just want to ask him a few more questions, that's all. Gary's harmless. I mean, he's a pain in the ass, because he's always just hanging around needing attention, but he couldn't really hurt anybody, I, I don't think. He gets thrown out of some places because he's awkward, a, a, a little strange. Ugh, sometimes he smells, but it's... <clears throat> he's homeless. I wanted to help him, but I never really had the time, you know? I mean, I, I didn't bother him when I found him pretty much living in the alley behind the club. Marcel, were you aware that back in 1975, Floyd Collister was on a list of suspects in the Barber Street murders? Yes, Floyd used to get into a lot of trouble with the police. He was a hooker and he took drugs. But, like I said, that's not the real reason why the police thought he was a deviant. Anyway, that's all water under the bridge now, isn't that right? He cooperated fully, as I recall, answered all the questions. They let him go, and after that, I decided that Floyd should <clears throat> move on, and he did. If I told you that out of the four male prostitutes that were identified as possible suspects back then, you're the only one left alive, what would you say to that? Ma'am, you're wrong. They're all dead. 
I'm sorry, but I really have nothing more to say to you. Hey, what's going on? Classic cork, huh? Gary, for a homeless guy, you sure have expensive taste in booze. Hand over the bottle, Gary. Yeah, of course, here. Why, what's wrong? Why are you looking at me like that, huh? Not exactly a four-star hotel. A love letter to Wally from Gary. That's just where Gary was holding the bottle. Nothing but weeds. It would have taken at least this much alcohol to kill Biganowski. What do you think? We'll need to process it. Could have been used to tie up our victim. Tell you what, I'll buy you dinner if that DNA doesn't come back a match to our victim. Told you. Too bad about dinner. Maybe next time.
That's peculiar. Lon Muskie's name was written down in a different type of ink stock. Gary practically lives at the club, and he found Beganowski's body, but I have no idea why his prints would be on a case of booze nowhere near the crime scene. Yeah? I'm gonna need to see some evidence before I go to a judge. Gary's got access to the club, and that bottle of classic cork might as well be a smoking gun, right? You bet we're bringing him in. I'll have Ray join you in interrogation. I think this is right up his alley. Mr. Beaumont, we found your fingerprints on a case of whiskey in Marcel's club. What can I say? I, I saw the case on the floor. It was already open. I needed it. My hands. They were shaking so bad. I, I just needed that drink so badly. But Gary, that was the same whiskey used to poison Mr. Biganowski. What? I just needed a drink. I, I didn't use it to kill Wally. Makes us think you're keeping other things from us. No, it, it, it's not like I always sleep there. I try to stay at the shelter, but sometimes it's full, so I have to stay where I can where I don't bother anybody. Open your mouth, please. Yes, of course. Ah. What? Of course not. I had no reason to be mad at Wally. We found your letter to Wally. You had some real feelings for him. Too bad. He just wasn't that into you, huh? Gosh, I know how that can hurt, right? Makes you wish you could sit him down and just talk. Maybe tie him down so he doesn't go anywhere while you're sharing all those real feelings. Maybe try to change his mind a little with a drink or two or three. Or hell, maybe the whole damn bottle, huh? Isn't that pretty much how it went down, Gary? No, it wasn't like that at all. I loved Miss A. I loved her so much. Let's all just calm down for a second. Why didn't you give Miss A the letter? I just wanted to write down my feelings. For once in my life, I wanted to be honest with myself. She knew how I felt about her. I told her. I said, I love you. And she looked at me, kind of puzzled, and said, it must be so nice to be able to say those words and mean them. And then she walked away from me. I wasn't even sure what she meant, but I had my answer. We would always just be friends, and I could live with that. That's a lovely story, Gary, but will a jury believe it? If you're innocent, you better start answering our questions. All of them. Okay. Okay, I'll tell you whatever you want. Why would I have an apron? Doesn't make sense. I'd never even seen that apron before. Four months later, Muskie's found dead in his car off Barber Street. Lon Muskie, is that his name? I never asked. Sure, I beat him up, but he deserved it. He would take my friends out on dates, 
and, and they would come back bruised, sometimes bleeding. I wanted to teach him how to treat a lady in a language he would understand. But I didn't try to kill him. He should have gone to jail. But that detective, she let him go. But what can you expect, huh? You guys look out for each other, and I can't blame you. What do you mean, we look out for each other? Do you mean we cops look out for each other? Muskie wasn't a cop. No, you guys, you know, black people. I'm sorry, I mean African Americans. Oh, now I've gone and put my foot in my mouth. I just... Well, that's what happened, okay? That black lady detective showed up and let him go. I don't remember exactly what she looked like. I remember that her badge surprised me. I'd never seen a black woman detective before. Wait a second, you're saying Detective Warries Briggs knew this guy and just let him go because she was black and he was black? Is that the load of bull you're trying to sell us about one of the most distinguished officers this department has ever known? Please, I'm only telling you what I remember. I'm not making anything up, I swear. Maybe it wasn't just a black thing. Come to think of it, the way they argued, maybe they knew each other. She did say she was giving him a ride home. I, I mean, I think. It was a really long time ago. Setting aside Mr. Beaumont's racial insensitivities, I think we need to take a better look at Detective Briggs' involvement in all of this. You want to know what I think? I think this guy's a lying sack. This is a photograph of Lon Muskie from the Barber Street Murders case file. Is this the man you assaulted? No, that's not the guy. I mean, I'm sure I'd remember him, and that's not him. That's strange. But take a look at this photograph, then. This is another Barber Street Boozer victim. His name is Matthew Dawes. Is this the man? That's him. That's the guy that hurt my friends. Matthew Dawes. If what you say is true, why would Waris write a different name in her notes? I still can't believe Detective Briggs has been hiding something from us. Did I hear Ray right? Detective Briggs's personal case notes were wrong? She must have known the victim was named Matthew Dawes. I hate to say it, but I think we need to get to the bottom of her involvement in all this. I can't believe it. And I'm not just saying that because I think this Beaumont guy's lying to us. Even if he were telling us God's honest truth, retired Detective Warris Briggs is one of the most dedicated and well-respected officers to ever serve in Las Vegas law enforcement. Hey. No judge is going to permit you to compromise her rights without some very compelling evidence. The name of the victim was written in different ink. These notes were altered after the fact to remove all trace of Matthew Dawes's name. I can't believe she deliberately tried to mislead us, but the evidence speaks for itself. Okay, I'll go with you to serve the warrant. Why don't you take Nick along too? Another pair of eyes won't hurt. What's going on here, Jim? We need to talk, Warries. You gotta tell me what's going on. You changed your case notes. You omitted the fact that you knew Matthew Dawes. Why did you do that, Warries? There's no way I can help you unless you tell me the whole truth. Jim, you've got a lot of nerve coming in here like this. Like I'm some sort of common criminal. I gave my life serving this city. I demand some damn respect. Hmm. It's a shrine. I've known some cops who could never let go of some cases, but not like this. Makes grocery shopping easy. No need to unload the car.
Whoa, is this the right RV? More Barber Street boozer paraphernalia, nothing we don't already have. The Barber Street area. All the convenience of a real one. Maurice knew this Dawes guy all right. Looks like they were more than just acquaintances. I never would have pictured you in pink, Maurice. Hey, I'm off the clock, but if you guys need a hand, count me in. The Barber Street Boozer is a part of Vegas history. If he's back, then I want to be there when we take him in. Thanks, Greg. We can use all the help we can get. Maybe we'll have better luck with a different magnification. What if we try zooming in or out? Yep, the fiber we found in Detective Briggs' trailer matches the apron found in the dumpster. Now what was she doing at that club? Yeah? I know this is tough, Jim. Look, I'm not gonna lie to you. This is very personal to me, and I'm not gonna do anything to impugn the reputation of Detective Briggs. So if you don't start bringing me some indisputable physical evidence that puts her in that club, killing Biganowski, then I'm not gonna do a damn thing for you on this one. Sure this is right? Okay. So the fiber from the apron puts Detective Briggs at the crime scene. I don't know. If you weren't the one asking, I'd say go back and try again. But I'll see what I can do. I'm not promising anything. In fact, I hope the judge turns us down. Detective Briggs, we found the victim's blood on an apron behind the club. A thread from that same apron was in your home. That's why you brought me in? I probably had the same kind of apron at some time. That's no evidence. How dare you accuse me of this? Maurice, I may be the only friend you have right now. You have the right to talk to your lawyer, but you and me, we're cops. I know where you're coming from. Talk to me. Just because I carried a badge doesn't make me your sister, Jim. You have no idea where I come from or what I've been through. I'm sorry, we'll need to swab the inside of your mouth. You go right ahead and do your job, then. Matthew Dawes? No, who's that? He was a victim of the Barber Street Boozer. Gary Beaumont seemed to think you had shown Mr. Dawes preferential treatment in an earlier altercation. Gary Beaumont is a criminal. You're gonna take his word over mine? I don't know any Matthew Dawes. We found a photo of you and Matthew together. You were obviously close. If you already knew that, why'd you ask the question? 
I told you, I heard about this on the news, same as everyone. I never saw the victim before. DNA under Biganowski's fingernails matches Detective Briggs. I can't believe a cop would kill someone like that. She was a hero in the department. I'm not looking forward to that press conference. I guess this means the Barbara Street boozer remains on the loose. Or maybe he's just passed into legend. Greg, we're not done with Detective Briggs yet. She may still hold the answer to the boozer case. I never saw the victim before. We found your DNA under the victim's fingernails. It's over, Waris. We have all the evidence we need to charge you. It just doesn't make sense. Why would you kill this man? Why were you even in that club that night? Have you ever lost someone you truly loved? Grief is like a cancer. Matthew Dawes was my fiancé. He was the Barber Street Boozer's third victim. He was the only man I ever really loved, with my body and soul. But the man struggled with a sickness, with a disease. You're trying to say he was gay. That's not a disease, Waris. It's a sin and a sickness. But we were working it out. We were praying, and we would have beaten this thing together. I know we would have. But then that monster took him away from me. Do you mean Floyd Collister? Hell yes, Floyd Collister. He was the boozer. How long have you suspected that Floyd was the Barber Street boozer? I don't suspect it. I know it. I had looked at Floyd for the killings before, more than once. I could never make it stick. Honestly, from talking to him, I didn't think he had it in him. I'd even been to that freak show club of his a few times, but I never saw anything like I did last night. I was just sitting in the back, watching for Collister or Beganowski or Beaumont, anyone on the list. No one paid me the least bit of attention, and then I noticed Floyd Collister walk in. It was hard to recognize him without the makeup and the dress, but there he was. And he was one mean son of a bitch for a change. Drunk, screaming at everybody. He even jumped all over Gary for going behind the bar and opening up a special stash of classic cork he was saving. Floyd started threatening Gary. You want a drink? I'll give you a drink. How about you drink until the black stuff starts oozing out your damn nose, you dirty old queen? That's when I knew, after all these years, I knew in my heart, in my gut, it was Floyd Collister. It was Floyd all along. He was the monster. It was Floyd all along. He killed Matthew. It wasn't revenge. It was justice. Justice? What the hell are you talking about, Waris? What's happened to you? I'm a cop, Jim. What's happened to me? I never stopped working the case. That's what's happened to me. Even after they forced me off of it, threatened to transfer me, I never let it go. It was personal, don't you get it? That disgusting creature murdered the best man I've ever known. 
I had to take him down. I knew I didn't have enough proof, but I didn't need it. I waited, put up with that awful damn music, until closing time. I was the last one left. Floyd came out in that ridiculous dress to tell me the place was closed. I acted like I was leaving, but when he turned his back, I hit him with a hammer fist to the back of the head, knocked him clean out. I may be old, but I can still take down a perp. I tied him up with an apron from behind the bar, opened up a bottle of classic cork, and started pouring it down his throat. He was slurring drunk by the time he woke up. I almost wished I'd held back a little, so that he could have appreciated his situation a little better. How did your DNA get under his fingernails? I got careless, let him grab me while I was coming in with a fresh bottle. Not that he could hold on to me by then. He just kept whining, not me, not me, crying like a damn baby. I bet Matthew didn't cry, you filthy bastard. Floyd Collister didn't perform last night. You killed his understudy, Wallace Biganowski. That's impossible. I saw him go backstage. I saw him go back there and come out dressed as a woman. I saw him. Detective, I think you were right when you said grief is like a cancer. Your fiancé wasn't sick, but you are. And now you'll have to pay for your sin as well. Oh, God, what have I done? I killed him, not me. Oh, God, no, no. Is there anything you can tell us that might help us put away the boozer? I don't know. I can't. The hairs. Did you ever get any of Collister's DNA? Did you try running it against the hairs from the crime scene? I tried, maybe 15 years ago, but there just wasn't enough there for a sample. But your lab already found one impossible sample from that skin flake. I went through the cold case evidence very thoroughly. There was no hair. There's got to be. I checked it into Central Property myself. I'll go to Central Property, but in the meantime... Waris Briggs. You're under arrest for the murder of Wallace Biganowski. Hey! I'll bring her in. I'm too old to play double dutch with you people. Walrus was right about that hair. It was in a separate folder, but otherwise exactly where it was supposed to be. They just missed it when they sent over the rest of the Barber Street Boozer file. Whoa, Marcel is the Barber Street boozer? Unbelievable. I've got to put this in my book. Grass better be ready for the press conference of his career.
What do you need? I'll see what I can do. Show me the evidence. It's the last call for Floyd Collister. I'll pick him up. Haven't I made it abundantly clear that Floyd Collister is but a distant memory? He might as well be dead and buried. Don't you think it's unhealthy to obsess about the past? There's nothing we can do to change it. It is what it is. You know the problem with the past is it's never past. We have your DNA, Marcel. We know you murdered those boys. I did, didn't I? And no matter how hard I try, I will never escape him. He's always a part of me. Even though, truly, Captain Brass, I am not Floyd Collister. Not anymore, anyway. Marcel wishes with all her heart that she could change what happened. But you cannot choose your destiny. Life's a bitch. I shall confess to all the unfortunate and dreadful details, Captain. But I shall refuse to my dying breath to say I killed Wally because I absolutely did not. I may have broken his heart, but I would have never extinguished his soul. I only left out a few minor details. Like removing the apron and chair? Oh, I don't know. They seem to obviously bring the boozer to mind, and I didn't want anyone to make the association. You can't run from your past. I never thought of it as running. I chose to think of it as metamorphosis. Perhaps even redemption. I was reborn as Marcel. All that rage and fear was gone. I was free. And for 35 years, I was bathed in love. Oh, what a glorious ride. Mars, Floyd Collister. You're under arrest for the murder of Matthew Dawes, Lon Muskie, Gus D'Souza. Congratulations on a job very well done. Not only did we solve a celebrity case, we closed a cold case as well. Eckley couldn't be more pleased. I realize you've only been with us for a short time, but you're a true professional. It's funny, I was just thinking the other day how you remind me of a criminalist who used to work with us, Wart Brown. You have his fire. Don't ever lose that. Anyway, you're a great asset to the team. I hope you're with us for a long time. Now go home and get some rest.